No, I was uh, drafted in um, October of 42 and um, was classified to uh, go to radio school and ended up in Chicago, Illinois um, at, at a hotel that the Army Air Corps had taken over as a school. And we were there from November of 42 to March of 43. And um, we graduated as radio operator mechanics. And we had uh, the Morse code and um, mechanical uh, ability to know what was going on in the radio. Um, I was with a group that was sent to Boca Raton, Florida for a radar school. And um, the conditions living there uh, were atrocious. And several of us decided <clears throat> that um, radar was not our future in the Army Air Corps. And we were told that um, every Saturday we would take a test, and if we didn't pass the test, we would be out of there by the following Tuesday. And uh, we decided um, to um, follow up on, on the opportunity. And by Wednesday, we were out of Boca Raton. And we were on the way west um, to um, Salt Lake City, which at that time was a uh, staging area for anybody that had gone to tech schools. And um, he, uh, we were there. Uh, to be classified and sent for assignment. Um, three of us from New York who were radio operators, we, we piled out together. We found out that if you apply for flying status, you would be um, allowed to fly as a crew member. Uh, you had to attend aerial gunnery school. And if you um, completed the course, you'd get your wings. Um, you would get a certificate a promotion to sergeant and be eligible for flight pay, which sounded pretty good to youngs. Um, we went to school. We went to school at uh, Wendover, Utah, where it was supposed to be a um, gunnery school, and we lived under intolerable conditions. The temperatures were in the uh, high 90s and hundreds on the soft flats of Utah in the daytime and down to the 40s at night. Um, we had, um, the facilities were old CCC barracks, which was the Civilian Conservation Corps before the war. We um, were using outhouses as latrines. Um, water was trucked up every day, continually, and uh, we were taking showers. Um, eight weeks later, we graduated and we were assigned to a um, base in Moses Lake, Washington, brand new base. Uh, when we arrived, the only thing that were finished were the runways and a couple of hangars. The barracks were unfinished. We lived in tents for about 10 days, and then we were allowed to go into the barracks. There we formed up as a crew. Um, I was a radio operator, and within three or four days, we had come together as 10 men, um, and we were from all parts of the country. Oddly enough, three of the 10 were from New York State, and two of us were both from Brooklyn, New York. And um, we became a crew. We were part of a 30-crew group, which were called provisional, which we didn't know what it meant. We found out later. Um, we trained as, uh, for three and a half months as a crew. And we ended up going overseas on the Queen Mary with 15,000 troops. And when we arrived in England five days later, we were immediately assigned to a bomb group. When we walked into our bomb group at 8.30 at night, there was um, six enlisted men laying on their beds and 24 empty beds. And someone said, Why, who were those? Uh, where were those guys from those beds? They said, oh, they were shot down the last few days, which for us was devastating because we were flying high with our egos. And when we heard that news, you could hear our egos crashing. And this was October of 43. And by November the 26th, we were called out for our first mission. We, we were 30 crews. And the way, what they did was, in training, they broke us up into um, flights, uh, six crews. So we weren't 
backing each other up. There were just so many aircraft for training purposes. So some would be in classes for the day, uh, others would be flying, um, and we just somehow, um, you know, didn't get uh, in, into a confusion. But when we went overseas, we went overseas as a group. That's uh, 300 men, and most of us were assigned to the 388th Bomb Group. And out of the, I've done a, a lot of research on this. I'm a historian, and of the 30 crews, only about five survived the war. Uh, we arrived in late October of 42, and the exact date I don't remember. But when we went out to uh, the first airplane that we were assigned, my pilot asked the ground crew uh, chief, um, how many crews have you had? Now this was in October, and the 388th had arrived in England in late August of 43, and he said, well, you're my third crew. And my pilot said, well, this crew is gonna finish. And he was right. Uh, his name was Kirsted, K-E-I-R-S-T-E-D. Uh, he was from Cincinnati, Ohio, and he was a, a little more mature. He was about 26 years of age, and he actually turned out to be a very good leader. And um, we had a close-knit crew. We were like family, because in training we were together almost every day, either in a classroom or in the aircraft flying training missions. Nettishall, which is the home of the 388th, we flew, we flew uh, all of the major missions, including the missions of Big Week, which were four missions in February of 43. And um, we flew the four missions, all of them were long range, 11 and a half hours, one for uh, another 11 hours. Um, and as 22 year olds, we, when we finished those four missions, we were physically and mentally exhausted because how much could you take? And my pilot wanted to get finished in a hurry, so he had volunteered to fly a couple of times when we could have had, uh, had passes. Uh, we, we flew um, the longest raid of the war at the time to Pozan, Poland on February the 20th of 43. And when we got to the target, the, the um, target was uh, cloud covered, so um, the B-17 had stretched its limit for distance, and the mission commander had to decide uh, what to do in a hurry, and we came out to the coast of Germany and dropped our targets, uh, bombs rather, on a target of Rostock, which at that time was a seaport. And going back to England, we were over the Baltic, and we have, were able to come down at lower altitude, and uh, one or two aircraft from the uh, overall group had uh, 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 gone into Sweden uh, because they felt they couldn't make it back to England. But we were fortunate. It was the winter and usually dark by 4.30, and those planes that survived and got to England landed at the first base they could see. Uh, we were fortunate we got back to our home base and into our own beds that night. Our crew was lucky. We suffered one injury, and that was an accident, not a combat industry, uh, injury. And we finished our 25 missions, flying our last of the 25 to the first mission on Berlin, March the 4th. Um, the mission was aborted by the 8th Air Force, but we decided to drop our bombs, which um, was a no-no at the time because we dropped out of formation to do it. We, we dropped our bombs tried to get back into the formation. We were jumped by a, a FW 190, which we didn't know until after we were back in England. Um, we escaped somehow, and by the time we got back to England, we landed with no brakes, and um, the crash trucks came out, the ambulances and everybody looking for um, injured and damaged aircraft, and we said, we were all okay, and they said, well, look at the 20 millimeter holes in one in the radio room, one in the bomb bay, and one in the waist. And one had somehow missed me in the radio room, and it had penetrated right through the hull and not exploded. And when we got back to our barracks, we were happy guys because on March the 6th, two days later, was the 8th Air Force first raid to Berlin, and 69 bombers were shot down, the most in one day. And we were in our beds sleeping. So, um, I was caught overseas 
uh, when I finished my tour with seven other radio operators, and we were instructors uh, for new groups coming in. And as soon as the groups flew their first mission, um, we were released to go home. Um, when I was passing through London, I got the feeling that somehow D-Day was coming, and I met infantrymen uh, who were on pass in um, London, and they were wearing a, the, our green field jacket, which was not to be allowed to be worn off the base. And I asked one of the guys going up in the elevator in my hotel, well, why are you allowed to wear that stuff in uh, London? And he said, we're regular army, and we were just um, re-equipped with all our field equipment and taking all our class away, A uniforms we were taken away. And um, I got the feeling that day, day was coming and I would be out on the first train out of London to a place called Chorley, which at that time was for uh, replacement people going home. And uh, while we were there, uh, we were off the base in the morning um, on a tour of the area. And when we came back, they announced on the PA of the base that Allied troops have landed on the beaches of Normandy. And right away, through the camp, went the feeling, uh-oh, we're all going to go back and fly more missions. And about 5 o'clock in the evening, they announced all men here will return to the zone of the interior, which at that time was the United States. And on June the 9th, we sailed from Liverpool. And I'm a New Yorker, and when I saw the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, Seven days later, I was a happy guy. I was 22 years of age, I wanted to get married, and um, the rest <laughs> is basically history. Um, I spent the rest of the war flying on B-29s in um, uh, New Mexico as a radio instructor, and it was actually flying a training mission uh, the day the uh, a first A-bomb was dropped in Japan. We had, uh, we called it the worry ward, it's in the history books as well reward, but it, we never got it on the airplane. Okay. Yeah, we have the A2 jackets with the worry ward, um, and I had donated my original jacket to the museum in Savannah. Uh, in, important papers that were important to me personally, um, from the archives, which they allow you later to do, and um, one of them is the condition of the airplane on our last mission which was reported by the engineering officer. And one of my sons, my oldest son, who lived in about a half an hour from the museum, had taken the day off to come with me. And I showed him this report. And it said um, exactly uh, the right upper wing had uh, extreme um, damage, fragmentation damage, and there were three 20 million holes in the aircraft. So he made a copy of it. And that night when we went to dinner with my other son and my four grandchildren, he said, this is how close we were to not being here. <laughs>